Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, sons and daughters, fathers and mothers, you're all welcome to today's wonderful session of Spiritual Civilization. This is Season 2, Episode 3, a vibrant discussion brought to you by One Desire Ministries. Uh, the vision of One Desire is to build a nation of true worshippers united in love. And the mission, how it intends to achieve its vision, is by imprinting the essence of Christ in the hearts of men. Led by Deacon Rob Omo, um, One Desire was birthed uh, many years ago, uh, way, way back in the early 2010s. And uh, its heart was in pursuing God through prayer and the word, meeting in parks within our wonderful city of Nairobi, where we would set aside time, a tithe of our day, if you could say so, to seek the face of God. Now, because we were very young at the time, we needed a bit of guidance, we needed a bit of coaching, we needed a bit of fathering. And that is where the individual who is going to moderate today's session comes in. He is a seasoned minister in the body of Christ who has over 25 years of ministry under his belt. He submits to a spiritual father who subsequently also submits to a spiritual father. He understands accountability and also raises his sons to pursue it passionately. He is the overseer of uh, a ministry known as Infinite Fellowship Ministries and the spiritual oversight of one desire. His name is Bishop John Ojuku Kobanka. Um, as he moderates, there is one individual who actually two individuals have not introduced. On my left, we have Pastor Evans, uh, an individual who is very passionate about seeking the face of God. Um, and also, for those who are not aware, my name is Reverend uh, Richard. I do serve in One Desire Ministries. But now to the meat of today's session. Bishop Gobanga, J.O. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to say uh, welcome to this broadcast. Uh, as you've been uh, told, uh, my names are Gobanga, J.O. Um, and I prefer being referred to as Gobanga. But insofar as designation is concerned, I am Bishop uh, Gobanga, J.O a presiding clergy of the Infinite Fellowship Ministries. I'm also uh, involved with One Desire Fellowship, uh, a wonderful fellowship that ministers to the body of Christ. And I've been with uh, members of this fellowship uh, for close to 12 years now. And uh, some of them are uh, seated together with me in my living room. So friends, uh, we want to straight away go to the to the business of the hour. And this is just to break the bread of God's word today. Um, I'm going to ask um, Rob, I want you to read Genesis chapter one, uh, verse uh, 26. Uh, and then um, I'm going to ask uh, Evans, you're going to read Colossians chapter two from verse nine to 10. Genesis chapter one from verse... 26. This is the KJV version. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Um, reading Colossians chapter 2, this is from verse 9 to 10. Um, I'll be referring to the Amplified Classic Edition. Verse 9 says, For in him the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. Verse 10, And you, and you are in him, made full and having come to fullness of life. In Christ you too are filled with the Godhead, that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and reach full spiritual stature. 
and he is the head of, ho of all rule and authority of every angelic principality and power. So, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Today I want us to discuss about uh, one aspect of uh, the divine element of man. Yeah. And this is uh, man uh, being the abode of the fullness of deity. Man mm -hmm. being the abode of the fullness of deity. You know, as man moves to higher dimensions of his existence, more so in his pursuit of God, what is basically happening is that man is literally engaging in the constant mode of discovering who he is. Okay. There is no way man can know himself except that he gets to know God. Yeah. And for man to be able to know God, he has to pursue God. And for him to be able to pursue God, he has to be in the process of movement because we serve a God of movement. God is not static. He is a God of movement. And because God moves from everlasting to everlasting, from progression to progression, from succession to succession, man at the same time is supposed to be in that process whereby he keeps moving. Man is supposed to be in motion, moving from one dimension mm. to another dimension, from one scope to another scope, from one expanse to another expanse, mm. from one realm to another realm, all in the business of pursuing God. And the more he keeps pursuing God, the more man is at a place whereby he is constantly engaging in the process of discovering who he is. Because as we, just as we've read in scripture, man was made in the image of God. That is what uh, we were able to read from Genesis 1.26. Mm. And you see, the movement that, that is being spoken about here is a movement that starts from that which is concrete to, 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 to that which is construct. Mm. God made man out of himself. The image of God was ingrained within the fabric of man. And uh, when we look at scripture throughout, insofar as man's interaction with the deity is concerned, we are able to deduce that God gave man the pattern of all creation. In other words, what I mean is that God vested himself and the works of his hands in man. And within the DNA of man, everything that pertains to creation is embedded. Within the DNA of man, everything that pertains to the mystery of godliness is embedded. Or better put it this way, that God simply manifests himself in man. And friends, we must understand that man is fully man. And, 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 and then we must also understand that there is something about deity that man has. Man is physical, man is also spiritual. In other words, man has access to both the natural and the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Man can access the, the, the spiritual realm just as in the same way he accesses the, the natural realm. Now, the reason why we know that man is spirit and the reason why he accesses the spiritual realm is so that he may be at a place where he communes with the divine. Mm -hmm. The reason why man accesses the spiritual realm is because God ordained man to live in the spirit. God never ordained man to live in the natural. Mm. The reason why we have the natural realm is so that man may be able to manifest all that he is and who he is insofar as the spiritual dimension is concerned. And understand that the body of man is basically an organic system that functions according to the design of the creator. Mm -hmm. You are given a body not for anything but to function according to God's intended purpose. Yeah. You are given a body so that the divine may be able to reveal himself and manifest himself, or rather, better uh, put it this way, to manifest his purpose. Mm. And that's why, friends, the body of humanity is very important to God because, friends, you must understand that this body is, it actually serves as a gateway through which the supernatural meets the natural. Mm -hmm. But now, when man fell in the garden, what happened is that there was a separation between God and man. 
Now, this separation also led to the separation between the spiritual as well as also the natural, you know? Because friends, we know very well that man in his pristine state, being that he was a gateway for the spiritual to access the natural, it basically means that the only way the divine would be able to touch base with the natural realm was through mankind. Yes. Because man was, or was, was ordained to function as a portal. But the fall of sin, what it did is that it destroyed that particular portal. It made that portal to be incapacitated to the point whereby the separation between the supernatural and, and, and the natural became so evident. And friends, we must uh, realize that this was not just a, a loss to man insofar as him falling short of the dimensions of God as well as the perspectives of God. Even the Godhead experienced that loss as well as also the rest of the creation. Understand, friends, that God gave man a body to function as a locomotive apparatus for for the deity to be vested and to find expression in and through the same. Because, you know, we've just read here in scripture, and this is talking about Christ, that uh, the Godhead, or rather it pleased the Godhead to find a dwelling place in Christ. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. And this is what actually pleased the Father. Now, um, as I was pondering on this, because this is something that I touched base uh, a couple of years ago, I began to ask myself this question. If the Godhead were to dwell, or rather if it pleased the Father for the fullness of the Godhead to find a board in Christ himself, where exactly was the Godhead dwelling? My understanding of this in my careful analysis of scripture was that the God had actually found an abode in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are to take it further, which particular body are we talking about here? Because we know very well that Christ is spirit, but at the same time, Christ also has a body. Mm -hmm. Okay? He has a body. Now, the body in this particular case would refer to the body of man in its perfection. Mm. Okay. Because you see, Christ is the head mm -hmm. and the body of man is basically the church. Yeah. The church is the body of Christ. Yeah. Okay. So that means that it is the body of man in its perfection that could house the entire Godhead. Mm -hmm. Because God did not give Christ a different body but our own. Christ does not have any other body. The only body that Jesus has is our own. Mm -hmm. When I talk about our own, I'm talking about the entirety of the church, which is the body of Christ. For it was man's body that deity would reside in. Of course, at a personal level, each and every one of us is a carrier of the presence of God. And it is true that each and every one of us is able to have a mm -hmm. sense of of, of, of a, 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 a sense of the fullness of deity in us at a personal level. But the truth of the matter is that the fullness, if we are to talk about the absolute fullness, the fullness mm -hmm. of, of deity, yeah, yeah. we are basically talking about the entirety of the body of Christ, which is basically the church. Okay. That's something that we must understand. Yeah. Because friends, we know very well that man from the substance of his making has the nature of God. Yeah. And that the completion of man can only come about from God. Just in the same way, we must also understand that there's an aspect also of the completion of God, mm -hmm. which also comes by reason of man. Because you see, God comes to a place of experiencing the epitome of his purpose when his son, Jesus Christ, becomes the manifest a dwelling place aboard of the Godhead. Mm. And in this particular case, it is making reference to man because Christ and man are one. Mm. And when you look at man in his perfected, in his pristine state, man was never separated from Christ. Man was always part of the Godhead. 
through Christ Jesus, the God that was part of man, I, to the point whereby even when man was placed on earth, we know very well from scripture that uh, divinity decided to put on the garment of, the, of, 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 of humanity through the body of man so that where man was, God was there. When man spoke, it was God speaking through man. Mm-hmm. Everything that man did, everything that man thought about, that was divinity. When man was naming animals, it was God naming animals. In other words, man was fully in God and God was fully in man. That mm-hmm. was their connection. And you see, that particular um, uh, mode of, of operation is basically supposed to give us a glimpse as to how the, 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 the physical world was in constant interaction with the spiritual world. Mm-hmm. Heaven and earth are one. Mm. Heaven was not a separate entity from mm. earth. Mm. The reason why the separation is because of sin. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's very, very important. Yeah. And um, for the Godhead to come to a place whereby there is completion, there must be a body, and that body is basically the body of man. Now understand this, beloved. Um, when you're talking about, and I'm trying to talk to, to, to share this very carefully so that uh, people do not begin to lift some of my statements out of context. When we talk about uh, the Godhead, we are talking, we, of course, we know very well that the Godhead comprises of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Mm. Now, understand, I've talked about Christ having a body, and this body basically comprises of man. And when I talk about man, I'm talking about the entire human race locked up in man, which basically, uh, if we look at it in another way, is supposed to serve as a reflection of the cherubic nature mm. of existence. Because we know very well from scripture that uh, there are these uh, angelic beings which are known as cherubims. And you know, cherubims, uh, when, when you study the, 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 the account of cherubims as revealed in scripture, is that cherubims have actually four faces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the first face is that one of a lion, which basically denotes God the Father himself. Uh, it's, it's basi- it, it basically denotes a kingly, a kingly kind of uh, a nature or an expression. Then the other one is basically the eagle. The eagle basically stands for the revelation and the mysteries of Christ. And the other one is actually the ox. The ox basically denotes the working power and the laboring of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, in the, in, within the cherubic nature, we see the face of man, which is basically the inclusion of humanity in the Godhead. Mm-hmm. And therefore, what that means is that um, man is basically a full cherub. Man is a full cherub with three faces, one of God the Father, the other one of the, of, of the Son, the other one of the Holy Spirit and himself. And that is why it was very, very fundamental for man to be part of the Godhead. So that when man is part and parcel of the Godhead, there is a certain sense in which he is complete, just as also God himself is actually complete. Now, I'm not trying to say that man is equivalent to the rest of the persons of the, of the Godhead. No, man is not equivalent. Man is part of the Godhead through Christ. Mm. Man can only function to the degree that he remains hooked up with the head of the church, and that is Christ Jesus. Mm. So the position of man within the Godhead is insofar as his connectivity to Christ is concerned. Mm. That is something that we need to actually, uh, uh, you know, consider. Now, probably somebody might be asking uh, this question, that uh, Bishop, you're saying that... uh, Man experiences completion when he's part of the Godhead. And God also experiences completion when he's part of man. And maybe somebody is wondering, uh, Bishop, are you by any chance saying that God is insufficient except that man is there? Don't you think that is heretical? That is not what I'm saying. You know, the English language is very limited. It's very limited even insofar as 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 our attempt in trying to explain certain yeah. biblical uh, mysteries, yeah. so we find that there are certain definitums that might probably do a bit of injustice, mm. and that's why this particular forum is there for us to be able to elucidate some of the things that you're talking about. Now, when I talk about um, completion, what I'm basically saying is that uh, for man to be fully at a place where he is whole. He needs to come to a place of consummation 
with God and in God. For God to come to a place whereby he is able to experience that sense of wholeness, he needs to be at a place of consummation with man and in man. The word complete here basically means to consummate. In other words, it basically means man having depths of intimacy with God to the point whereby he becomes one with God and God becomes one with him. Because remember, God made man in his image and after his likeness for intimacy. <laughs> not for anything else, for intimacy. And it is that intimacy that enables man to be at a place whereby he is able to walk in dominion. Dominion is a function yeah. of intimacy. You know? The kingdom is also a function of intimacy where love is the currency. Mm -hmm. You know? And, 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 and that is basically the thing because even when you look at the passage of the Godhead, one of the things that we discover is that there is such a, a depth of a perpetual intimacy uh -huh. amongst the persons of the Trinity, uh -huh. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So man experiences this uh -huh. as being part of the Trinity so long as he remains hooked up with God the Son. Uh -huh. It is only through the Son that man is able to experience the intimacy that we're basically talking about, you know? And, um, you know, it is this kind of intimacy that enables man to be able to experience the the realm of uh, if I may put it this the realm of an approachable light which is basically the realm of, flat, of of fire and this is a realm that basically reflects the the, the glory of God and you know um, one thing we must understand if every human being were to come to the place of experiencing the fullness of the cherubic nature yeah. that I'm talking about then beloved the marriage between man and a woman is actually the dwelling place of God, for God dwells between cherubims. You know, when you look at, uh, at, at, the, at, at, at uh, the Ark of the Covenant, one of the things you discover is that there, there, there are two cherubims. Yeah. There are two cherubims, with, and, and you'll find that their wings overlay the mercy seat. Yeah. So what happens is, the glory of God appears between the cherubim himself. Mm -hmm. So those cherubims, Another way of looking at it is that they are basically represented, they are a representation of the, the, the coming together of a man and a woman in holy matrimony. Mm -hmm. And then God comes there. That is why marriage is not an institution that people should actually play around, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know, Psalms 99 verse 1 says, God dwelling between the cherubim. So that, and, and you see that dwelling is on the basis of intimacy. So the intimacy of a man and a woman, when they come closer to one another, as they draw closer to God, they draw closer to, to you know to each other. And uh, for those of us who are married, we must understand: for your marriage to work well, you must draw closer to God at a place of intimacy. Because it is only God who teaches a man matters of intimacy with a woman. It is only God who teaches a woman matters of intimacy with a man. So that's very, very, very fundamental. Mm -hmm. So I want to open the floor to further conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in what I've shared so far. So over to you, uh, gentlemen. I don't know what uh, has come to your mind or minds mm -hmm. uh, with regards to what I've just talked about. Um, I'll go first. Um, I, I love how you've elucidated about who man really is. One of the things that really sprang forth in my mind when you uh, began uh, sharing about how um, the way man is created in the image of God and within man is the DNA of all creation. When Christ was praying um, in John 17 for the the disciples and for we for even us who are to who are to come after the disciples um he said may they be one the way i and the and you the father are one and at that point uh, what what you are just sharing has just given me the realization that christ was actually repackaging and re re uh reuniting who man really is because man is not the individuals uh, rob evans reverity man is us together coming together as one and 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 uniting ourselves with christ in intimacy 
um i i i loved that aspect there's also the the aspect about now the body being a portal um between the natural and the supernatural and it it's even an explanation of how we worship why it is very important for us not to forsake the gathering because when we come together man uh, is able to create a portal whereby the supernatural and the natural meet because the corporate man has come to get, has 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 uh, he is expressing himself um so this this is just a clear picture of the importance of the church it is a clear picture of the importance of unity of two or three gathering together and um and then also another thing that um i that really uh that really stood out is where you are talking about um man being a part of the godhead in christ um whereby um the, I, i think another realization that i got from that is we we have come from god and we manifest here on earth and we return back to god that reality has to be there because uh christ existed from everlasting to everlasting he exists from everlasting to everlasting and if we are the body of christ then being in him we existed in him and we come and manifest here on earth unite with him uh because of the work of the cross and return back to him um it's a uh, an amazing realization it 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 speaks a lot about immortality because immortality is where what bishop was sharing about the consummation when we when we experience immortality as as men we unite with eternity and there's that consummation yes so those are just a few points that i i have captured um just elucidating on some of the things that you've shared all right we are still having this conversation um yeah over to the other two gentlemen yes i think uh what you what you've spoken about bishop really says a lot about god as the creator yeah. and um i think i was asking myself as you were sharing if if god is the creator and um we are actually part of the god because of because we are in christ as the body of christ um i was asking myself does that does that make man the creator and i think i came to the conclusion that man is not a creator but he expresses the unique attribute of god as the creator through creativity mm. and uh it goes to mean that creativity is actually a function of the nature of god as the creator yeah so you you basically create out of the access of eternal realms you don't create out of uh, just your own basic and rudimentary understanding of what creativity actually means and so basically creativity is actually meant to be an expression mm-hmm. of the nature of the godhead mm-hmm. so what we see as creativity in the secular world i think i was i was looking back at some of the things that we've seen as creativity some of the things that um our generation will say they've hit as it were and i realized that a lot of those things are not actually creativity according to god because how god terms creativity is that creativity is actually meant to be an expression of your identity and it's basically your identity in him and so i i think that's the reason as to why it's very dangerous to be governed by what exactly is trending Yeah. I think social media is uh, is a very very powerful tool. Um but I think especially for our generation um as millennials one of the things that we really struggled with is growing out what seems to be trending and what seems to be fashionable from social media. And it's what defines our culture, it's what defines our lifestyle, it's what defines how exactly we go about doing things. And from there that's where we seem to be drawing out our inspiration to be able to create, yeah. to be able to be creative. 
Um, I think I've realized that creativity is not just limited to the arts. It's not just limited to the fact that perhaps you're gifted in singing, you're gifted in playing an instrument, you're an artist in regards to drawing or painting. It's not just limited to that. Creativity is even in how you actually express yourself. It is how you actually express, let me say, the salient aspects of your identity. It's in how you carry yourself out on a day-to-day -day basis, how you express yourself in regards to even spiritual gifting. Because things to do with the gift of healing, healing is actually a creative miracle. And so it's really, really redefined how exactly I, I see creativity in itself as a word because I've realized that there are many times, even as a creative, that I've actually tried to create out of my own understanding of what society is going through instead of creating out of the place of my, the understanding of my identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that is a challenge, especially for many creatives who are out there um, in the secular world. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So let's get to hear something from Rev. I mean, uh, today's session is uh, has started at uh, mind-boggling speeds, uh, ladies and gentlemen, following at home. Uh, every statement uh, mentioned, not only by Bishop, but by my two uh, gentlemen to my left, are, are just, they are, they are someone worthy. You can center there and, and ruminate and birth a sermon from them. But I just want to hone in on one specific item. Um, the marriage between a man and a woman is a dwelling place of God, for God dwells in between. Yeah. Cherubims. Yeah. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about that statement in a very intricate fashion, um, the cherubic nature as defined by Bishop that man was meant to occupy went beyond just the simple guarding of the presence of God. <laughs> we were not only meant to guard the same presence, but because we were made in the image and likeness of God, we were meant to be the representation of that presence. So if we look at that cherubic nature, man in his perfected state was meant to be the highest cherub ever created. Where not only does he guard the presence, but he represents it completely. When we speak of representation, we're talking about the DNA. I want you to take a journey with me even as I'm sharing my point. Yeah. You know, Bishop highlighted that the DNA has the embedding capacity that God had set aside for not only all the works of creation, but his purpose for the human race. Mm. That very DNA carries something higher than the cherubs that we know in the angelic order. That DNA carries the capacity to manifest purpose at the very motion of God. Mm -hmm. This is beyond any instruction where the ministering spirits are sent via instruction. <laughs> This is as a result of motion, because motion is a higher dimension of instruction. Mm -hmm. Instruction requires you to be at a lower order of creation, but motion requires you to be in step with the, with the, with the highest order of creation, yeah, yeah. which is the Godhead. Yeah. And when we look at motion, as a married couple, we need to be constantly moving in and with God. Mm -hmm. A marriage that is not constantly moving in and with God is outside of intimacy. Mm -hmm. So any intimacy that we define within the construct of the natural is not true intimacy. Mm -hmm. The intimacy that is being spoken of here is dominion and kingdom purpose. Mm -hmm. Those being the true functions of that intimacy that is spoken about. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the marriage, it has very little to do with what you are manifesting mm -hmm. and more to do with where you're dwelling. Mm -hmm. Are you dwelling in God? Are you consumed by him in a way that you are now consummated in him? And is he dwelling in you in a way that he's consumed by you, in a way that he dwells within you and he manifests himself through you? Yeah, yeah. Marriage is a mystery and I'm loving what I'm hearing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm. You know, one of the things that um, you'll discover when you when, when you study scripture mm. is that there are certain functions that were delegated to angelic beings mm -hmm. and also to some extent, some functions uh, were delegated or designated to God the Son, whom we read in the Old uh, Testament as the angel, the, the angel, the angel of God or the angel of the Lord, I think. Mm. Mm. Uh, and we know very well that the angel of the Lord was basically a theophanic representation mm. 
of God the Son. This is something that even theologians are all in agreement. Now, I wish to say categorically that these roles were never intended by any other person except man. But because of man's fallen nature, man was not able to be a true representation of God to the point where by now we read about um, the likes of, um, of, 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 the, of the archangel Michael, uh, who was a cherub. We read about Gabriel, who was a messenger. Uh, and, 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 you know, these beings, they were basically being assigned to carry out divine errands on behalf um, of God. And the errands that they were being assigned to actually carry out, these were the very errands that man should have actually been at a better place of being able to discharge. Because, you see, uh, we don't read of Michael, the angel, the archangel, having the same, same nature as, um, as, 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 as man. Same case also applies to Gabriel and all the other angelic order. Much as we read about cherubims and we know who they are, the truth of the matter is that the more you study about cherubims, in the, most in the Old Testament, the more you discover that these cherubims, they were just a shadow. They were just a shadow of the true cherubim who was supposed to be man. Mm. And you see now God the Son taking the form of... Uh, of man and also in the old testament we know that there were times he appeared as in 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 human bodily form other times he was also he appeared like the angel of the lord the truth of the matter is that this particular position was supposed to, to have been occupied by man yes yeah, but man was not able to play some of these designations because of his fallen nature mm. and you remember in a, in a, in, a, in another recording I, I i i told us something that um, would actually mess up the theology of some people yeah. That, uh, you know, uh, Adam, in his pristine state, had access to all information that he needed. Mm. Adam was not uh, made in the image of God to live in time. Adam was made in the image of God to live in eternity. Mm -hmm. In other words, Adam was made in the image of God and after his likeness to live in God and with God whereby time was not a factor. The only thing that Adam would do was that he was supposed to reveal nothing else other than God in time. Mm. Yet he himself, he was not supposed to be bound by time. He was not supposed to be subject to the elements of uh, the order of creation mm. because of the, because of the uh, if I may use the word, the lofty state, in, uh, the, the lofty position he actually occupied. Yeah. And when I use the word lofty, I'm using it carefully. Lofty in its purest form, yeah. you know? Yeah. A position that was way exalted above all other works of creation, you know? Including the angels. You see, because angels are basically, the Bible refers to angels as ministering spirits. So now what that means is that man was supposed to be the very, very one individual that was supposed to be assigned the responsibilities of, among other things, to guard the presence of God, you know, to guard the presence of God, to carry out certain things on behalf of God, such that even the angelic order that uh, was in existence, these angels were supposed to be subject to the authority of man, just as man is subject to the authority of God. Mm -hmm. That is something that we need to actually, um, uh, you know, understand. So that now when we say that man is man has a cherubic nature, we are basically saying that this kind of nature is not just ordinary nature. This is this is one, uh, if I may use this word, this is one order mm. of the cherubic uh, uh, form that could house the Godhead. Mm. Archangel Michael cannot, mm. could not, neither could Gabriel. Yes. Neither could any dog or any cat in the Garden of Eden. It was only supposed to be one particular uh, creature that God made. And this creature bore the resemblance of the image of God as well as also his likeness. And this is man. So you, so you can just see, friends, just how fallen man was. Mm -hmm. We don't read in scripture about angels being given dominion. We don't read in scripture about any other animal being given dominion. Mm. Dominion was actually given to man. And you know, Satan knew all these things, you know. One thing about Satan, he knew very well 
that the only way to usurp the position of man was to deceive man. Mm. And he deceived man through um, his wife, woman. Mm. Man was created by God. Mm -hmm. Man was created with God. Man was created in God. And man was created for God. Mm. Okay? Man was created to God. And the raw materials for making man was God himself. Mm. There's no any other raw material. What do I mean? The raw materials was the, 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 the two the two raw materials that we read in scripture are one his image, the other one his likeness. Mm. And this is what is actually displayed in man. So when you're defining man, we are basically talking about all the substance of his making. His image as well the, 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 the image of God rather, as well as also the likeness of God. Those two are very important substance because in those two substance, you'll be able to find multiplicity of other component, components of sorts, which are basically extracted, number one, from the presence of God, number two, from the glory of God. Hallelujah. When mm. you talk about mm. uh, the image of God, you are basically talking about uh, the glory of God. We are talking about the holiness of God. Mm. That is image. Image basically means glory of God. We are talking about, um, the, you know, the holiness of God. When you talk about likeness, you're basically talking about righteousness. Because righteousness is holiness in action. Mm. Righteousness is the manifestation and the expression and the activation of holiness in action. And therefore, if we are to talk about man being outside of God, any man who is outside of God is not fully man. Hey. Okay? Mm. Mm. It is only the triune being of man that makes him fully man. If you're a person who's not a believer and you're watching this broadcast and you call yourself a man, I don't care whether you are bearded like me. I don't care whether you have a deep voice like me. Understand this. You are not a man. Okay? You're not a man. And it doesn't matter even if you've gone through any rite of passage that makes you to think that according to your community, you're a man. As far as I'm concerned, you are not a man. The only one person that I can consider a man is the very person who is in God. Yeah. In other words, you must be born again. Mm -hmm. Jesus must be your savior. You must allow him into your life so that you may actually experience what it means to be a man. It's not by a rite of passage. Understand this, friends. The reason why God created man in his image and after his likeness was to bring forth an exact being like him. You know? Okay. Whereby... You are three in one, united in purpose and having, uh, but having, uh, you know, distinct capability. And you know, because of the nature that man has, what it does is that it can enable him to be able to operate both in the natural as well as also the supernatural dimensions. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, man in his present state is not fully man. Be in other words, I'm saying that the, uh, what, 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 what basically I'm saying is this. The fullness of man is basically the fullness of God. Man has to come to the place whereby he experiences the fullness of God to abide in him, for him to be able to be fully man. Mm -hmm. There's a certain dimension, there's a certain place you must actually get to where you are at a point where you are experiencing the fullness of God. What that means is that you must be full of God. Or maybe I should put it this way. Man must put on the garment of God. And at the same time, you must allow God to put on the garment of your body as man. Mm. So that you are in God just as he's in you. That is the only way you experience the fullness of God. Now, maybe you're wondering how, how possible it is. First of all, be born again. And number two, <coughs> our, uh, be the kind of a person who develops a total devotion and communion and fellowship with God. Fellowship which is unbroken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. You know? Mm. You know, man should actually step into his uh, DNA structure. Man must step into the system of his DNA. Man must come to the place whereby he is able to perceive his blueprint, which the designer who is God had planned prior to his making. Hmm. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that we must go back beyond time. We must go back deep into ourselves. Because everything that God had ordained for you has, 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 has actually been buried within, within the recesses and the depository of your spirit man, of your heart. 
the Bible says he has ordained eternity in us. You need to step into, you need to go right into your DNA structure so that you may be able to see, so that you may be able to know and have the understanding and have the wisdom of your pattern. That is the only way you'll be able to know why you actually exist. You must come to the knowledge as to why is it that you're called man. And this can only be from the purity of God's mind, not from what society defines man to be. Because friends, from scripture we are able to deduce that man is the only being that can actually have the capacity to house the absolute God. And remember friends, there is more in the fabric of man which is wired and woven up to make God. Because the body of man, beloved, the body of man has gateways that can bring him into deeper dimensions of understanding that he is from the beginning. Mm. So over to you gentlemen. Bishop, I think one of the things that you've really uh, been able to elucidate for me is um, how the past, the present, and the future converge in man. Because um, I'll give an example. Enoch walked with God until he was no more. This is a man who was able to understand um, who he was in in God and was able to capture a, re a reality that was that is for um, this dispensation a reality that can, that will only be experienced in this dispensation whereby he was translated so he was able to capture the future capture the past bring it to a perfect present and he dwelt with God in that perfect present that's why he disappeared because he was uh, caught up in a perfect present. When you are able to um, be perfectly present, you are uh, a, a person who is able to, who, who has entered into eternity. And that is what God is actually calling us to when you just said that our we have to be born again, which means your life, um, that, that which is born again um, is something entirely new. You are a new creature, new creature, something that has never been seen or experienced before. You have to be born again, and then you have to have a life that is devoted fully mm. to God mm. in every aspect, um, not affected by circumstances of the world, because we, the world is a lower class. Mm. And even I, I realized uh, just from what you are sharing, even with the with, about the angels, the angels are also a lower class. Man is of a higher class, and um, just to show that with scripture, um, this is First Corinthians chapter six, uh, verse verse. Let me read from verse two. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And the world shall be judged by you. Are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? This is just this just goes to show how small the world is when when it comes to man, a man who has been redeemed, a man who is in Christ. No, and then verse three. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this particular life? So how we perceive ourselves, we, we need to really begin to see ourselves in God, the way he sees us. Um, and it is not in a, in a state where we are fallen because again, you have been born again, born of the spirit. And what we shall become, we do not even know. <laughs> it, it is that deep. It is that great because um, we we have we are we have already begun to experience um, when we be, when we experience the new birth we experience a life that is driven by the spirit whereby we do not know where we are coming from and where we are going we are moved along carried along um, just to echo what Rev Richard was talking about. 
motion being of a higher uh, standard. And that is what I have to share for this particular point. You know, um, you know the Bible says man does not live by bread alone. Yeah. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, that's King James. Mm-hmm. Well, that means, you see, you see, God's word is basically light. Okay. And it is light that carries knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about a man living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, we are basically saying that man shall live by the light of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom that comes from the mouth of God. Now, if you are to take it further and deeper, what comes to mind is the fact that um, we don't live based on uh, what circumstance dictates insofar as the elements of time and space is concerned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We live as a, we, we live by reason of the counsel yeah. of the word of God. And now this counsel does not talk about anything else. It talks about ourselves. Okay. Insofar as who we are. Okay. You see, the problem is that sin has made man to live a very fragmented uh, kind of life, such that we have completely detached ourselves from yeah. our pristine state. Mm-hmm. You see. And what God is doing is that he is illuminating the light of his word so that we may have knowledge and understanding of who we are in our pristine state. Mm-hmm. Because that is what enables us to walk in dominion. That is what will enable us to be able to manifest or rather to reveal the kingdom. That is what will enable us to be able to play a role uh, in, in, in the redemptive plan of God in so far as life is concerned because life is about fulfilling the purpose of God. Mm -hmm. So the word of God, the word that comes out of the mouth of God is a word that gives us knowledge, not just about God. The more we get to know God, the more we know ourselves in Him. This, This knowledge, what it does is that it creates a pathway for us to be able to access the depths of God, the heights of God and the breadth of God so that we are able to see the extent in which we are supposed to exist and the potential that we have that enables us to do what? To soar above circumstances. And you see, this is the thing that Enoch actually experienced. No wonder God saw him as one who had reached a certain level of perfection that it was not possible for Enoch to live in this particular world. The other way of looking at it is this way. When, When God calls Moses to the mountain, we read in scripture that Moses stay for 40 days yeah. and nights yeah. without any drink, without yeah. any food. Yeah. Now, the question that one would ask, how possible it is for such an individual to survive without any food and drink? My friends, it is possible for you to go without food and without anything to drink for 40 days and probably even more days, not because of your own ability, but because of the access yeah, yeah. that you have in God. When, when Moses goes into the mountain, God took him to eternity. Yeah. God takes him to to, 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 to to even before time. He takes him to the beginning. Yeah. He begins to show him and unveils to him how creation happened. I see Moses, you know, seated at a particular place, if I may use that word. And, and what happens is God begins to take him through the journey of the past. It's, it is yeah. as though Moses was living in the past and he saw the world how it was. Moses was able to see the fall of Lucifer. Mm-hmm. Moses was able to see the recreation of the world. Moses was able to see all these things. And it was as though Moses was participating in what exactly was happening, you know, mm-hmm. until the very time when he, he by, by the time he comes back, it would feel like he, like, like he had just been in some sort of a sleep for a few days. Yet the truth of the matter is that he had been there for 40 days and 40 nights. And the truth is that when he came out from the mountain, he was not hungry. If anything, his face was shining. Yeah. yeah. So that tells you that this body, when you subject you when when you subject this body to a certain to a higher to a higher dimension of 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 of, of revelatory knowledge and understanding and wisdom, there is nothing that can stop you from being able to accomplish what mm-hmm. you're supposed to do. And that's the reason why people fast and pray. We fast and pray so as to kill the flesh, to make sure that the carnal man is subdued so that the spirit man is alive. Mm-hmm. And when the spirit man is alive, and when the spirit man is strong, you can rest be assured that the body will obey. Mm-hmm. If anything, 
the appetite for the appetite for food will be suppressed yeah when you walk in certain levels of glory yes uh, richie hey hey <laughs> wow um i mean as i said the the frequency within which we are expressing the revelations of god in today's broadcast mm -hmm. is quite high and uh in as much as we can reference so many things i i just marvel at the mystery of the body mm -hmm. the body of man and mm -hmm. there was a statement that was highlighted and i just like to hone in there the body of man can bring him or her to deeper into deeper dimensions of understanding mm -hmm. that were designed for them from the beginning mm -hmm. you know i realize that there is so much we do not understand just because of the perspective we hold dear mm -hmm. by virtue of the treasure that we place to the perspectives that we have been brought up with that we have seen society call us into we have been robbed of a deeper level of understanding because where your treasure is yeah. your heart there is also yeah yeah because we treasure how society thinks we treasure how we grew up and the cultural norms that we were taught concerning there are so many things concerning the spirit realm mm. that we end up not entering into mm. Mm. and you see the body of man is one of those mysteries uh -huh. mm. because the body of man was not only created but it was formed Mm. Yeah. In its created fashion it was perfect and it was designed for eternal relevance. It was designed for motion from one glory to another, from one spiritual blessing to another. Mm. In its formation it was designed for manifestation. It was designed for establishment. It was designed for representation, not just being a, represent, a representative. Mm. And when we look at these mysteries concerning the body, yeah. We have to shed so much concerning our context. Yeah. And that's why no small wonder Bishop not only after mentioning that statement and our deacon and leader of one desire sharing very deeply concerning the reference to that statement, he went on to highlight that there is a mystery of prayer and fasting. Yeah. That there is a certain dimension where if you enter into understanding there are certain things that you shed off. And as one that Moses was a married man and he was not married to a Hebrew lady. Yeah. Yeah. And you know very easily he had marital obligations. Yeah. He would have said, "Oh, but I am a father. Oh, but I am a husband." Mm. Yeah. Mm. But the individual had had entered so deeply into God that he he more or less transfigured. Mm. From the context of his time and space, so you know, Bishop said he not only went to the past, but he went to the future. Yeah. And even tempted to think that there was a there was a time and space overlap. Yeah. I think if you study quantum physics, you'll be you'll be able to understand what what that reference means. There was a time and space overlap such that as he transfigured in the cleft of the rock, he was able to manifest Matthew chapter 17 in the transfiguration with Jesus Christ. Oh. I mean, when we think about the body, there's so much we don't understand because we have treasured what we see in our context. Mm. But I'm marveling at what God is revealing. Okay. Mm. You see, it's 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 really really important for believers to understand that there are places and there are heights of dimension and realms of God and in God that once we access you'll discover that we have placed lots of limitations on ourselves on account of societal obligations, mm. uh, you know, uh, as well as also circumstances. And yet, one thing that we, we must understand is that God deliberately sets mm. up certain circumstances or he allows certain circumstances in our lives, not because he does not care, it's because God uses that to slow us down. Mm. He uses circumstances to put a pause at the speed in which we are moving because sometimes we move faster than our brains. Yes. Sometimes we try to run faster than our legs can carry us and in the mm. process we end up landing into a ditch and we get hurt. So mm. sometimes God has to slow you down 
because of certain things that he wants to call you and to God wants, you know, you know what God w- 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 wants his children to know is that he wants to call them to a higher place of mm. walking with him and relationship. Yeah. Mm, it's true. Because walking and relating with God basically means that you discover more of yourself and this kind of walk will, 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 will catapult you beyond even where you are in so far as the, 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 the dispensation is concerned so that you're even able to access the future yeah. that God has called you to and the future that God has called other people into. And the reason why God does that is because he wants you to, 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 to use that particular access, that particular kind of knowledge in enabling you to know how do you prepare yourself for the future? How do you prepare the present generation for mm. the future? Yes. How do you prepare to pass over the baton from your generation to the next coming generation? He begins to t- make you understand that there are certain things even about himself that he wants you to handle. There are certain things about himself that he wants you to be able to bear. Because, you know, God has also got burdens. And he has got burdens not just for those who are who are physically existing. He has also got burdens even for the unborn. Mm. So, beloved, there is so much that we've put uh, ourselves to, to the point that it is for lack of a better way of putting it, it's like we've deprived ourselves of a lot of things. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and this uh, brings us to the end of part one of this subject. I would like you guys to tune in next week for part two. God bless you.